Although we are sharing this year's events virtually, the festival is based in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and we respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose culture has been lost forever and can never be recovered. We also acknowledge the island of Uktahumguk, Newfoundland, as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq, and we acknowledge Labrador as the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Inuav Ntsinan, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, and the Inuit of Nunatuhavut. We recognize all First Peoples who are here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As First Peoples have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the culture, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Good day, everyone. Welcome to Seen and Heard with the St. John's International Women's Film Festival. I'm Ninda Louise Janelle Duval, and I'm coming to you from St. John's Gadumcook. I am here with incredible filmmaker and director, Dennis Goulet. Hello, Dennis. How are you? Tense. Hello. I'm great. How are you? Really good. It's nice to meet you. I, Me uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, Night Raiders. I mean, I watched the film and I was really fortunate to watch it with my 15 year old daughter. Cool. So, uh, yeah, we curled up. Actually, my cousins are here, too. We all curled up as a family and got to view the film the other night. And it was it was amazing. So congratulations on that. I guess I'd like to start off by just giving you the opportunity to kind of talk about who you are and where you come from. I'd love to know. Yeah, um, Tense Dennis Goulet Nitsuniga Son, Ne Nai Apitaigo San Nina, Mistai Sage Gun Saskatchewan Oche. I'm Dennis. I'm from um, <clears throat> La Ronde, Saskatchewan, and I'm Cree Metis. I'm, of course, the writer and director of Night Raiders, and I'm um, here in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Anishinaabe. Awesome. It's really nice to meet you. You too. Um, I, <laughs> I guess we'll uh, pop right in. Actually, I'll kind of place myself too. So I'm, I'm Mi'kmaq El Nu from the West Coast of Newfoundland. Uh, and I've been working with the St. John's International Women's Film Festival in different capacities, mainly as a lover of the work um, for the past few years. So sometimes they invite me in to have conversations with uh, amazing artists, and I, I'm very grateful and fortunate for that. So I'm really honored to sit in conversation with you today. Amazing. Um, <laughs> so we're just going to jump right in. So, um, you know, I in watching the film, I could tell that you're heavily influenced by your lived experiences and your experiences in community and uh, community narratives in general. So I just want to talk a little bit about how that um, has influenced your approach to your work. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I got involved in filmmaking in well, my first job on a film set was back in 1998. And I was hired to be like an assistant on set actually by the filmmaker Tasha Hubbard, who's incredible. And we worked our first job on a film set together. And it was the CBC miniseries called Big Bear, which had an all Indigenous cast, including the late Gordon Tatusis, Tantu Cardinal, Gail Maurice, who's in Night Raiders, Michael Grayeyes, Lauren Cardinal. And it was just like, like, first off, I caught the bug on the first day. But then secondly, it was like this incredible all Indigenous cast with the late Gil Cardinal at the helm of this quite large scale um, CBC miniseries. And that was my first experience on a film set. So I just thought, wow, this is incredible. This is the best. Like I was just like, you know, beside myself. And then I began working in casting in the industry and I quickly learned that an indigenous person at the helm of larger productions like that was in fact very, very rare. And it made me start to feel incredibly hungry as I worked my way up in the industry for more stories that reflected my experience. And I had this experience in a casting room once I had moved to Toronto and there was this like um, character who was kind of like a Pocahontas archetype who 
like stands and it was for a US television pilot and she stands over a waterfall stoically silent and then mm -hmm. dies she sacrifices herself and I was a part of the casting team that had brought in all of these incredible indigenous actresses into the room that I greatly admired their work. And one by one, I saw them all silenced and then die. And I just thought, first off, I felt so shameful. And then I also just felt like this is the best that we can give these actors, you know, in terms of, and then also just the representation of an indigenous woman and her value just being simply to say nothing and then die. And because it was an audition, I saw, I watched it happen over and over and over again. And I feel like that was, that moment became like a catalyst where I just said like, we have to do this. And I looked around at the time and I was like, who's gonna do this? And I didn't know that I could be a director. I just decided to try to start making films. And I also around that time got involved in the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival. And that opened me up to like this global indigenous community of filmmakers. And it blew my world wide open. And I started to watch filmmakers. And at the time, this is the early 2000s. So it was like Atanarjuat had just come out and had taken the world by storm. And all of us were so thrilled and excited by the possibilities that, that felt were there suddenly. And yet Atanarjuat, you know, really sort of ended up being kind of like standing alone, like it, a wave of indigenous film and support for indigenous film did not follow that. But I think what Isuma did, um, you know, and they also talked about even their difficulties getting funding in the aftermath of Atanarjuat, which is, you know, totally crazy because that film should have just like opened up the universe for them. Um, but I think what it spoke to was an industry that wasn't there or ready and still in a place of ignorance and dismissal when it came to our stories. But Isuma was incredible because they really were the trailblazers in um, in community based filmmaking. You know, they work in the community. They hire, you know, traditional artists to like create the costumes and the production design and you know they they do filmmaking in a much more collective way and I think I was really inspired by that so when I started making my short films in earnest I started going back home and like asking myself what can I change about back home to Saskatchewan to shoot my films um and I would be asking myself, what can I do to change this process to make it different or to experiment with it in a way that feels truer to who I am and my values? Mm. And like that collective voice that you got to bring with you from your earlier projects. I mean, I'm sure you still work with a lot. Obviously, you still work with a lot of those people today. And they kind of like, you know, there's this empowerment that comes from building community within uh, filmmaking and, and I guess you're still very much connected to that community that's been built and it, it's it's obviously gotten stronger talking about getting back to community and I, I'm skipping it way ahead into the future and where I was going to place this question but <laughs> I feel that it's so important to discuss capacity like you know when you're talking about the you know the roots of community filmmaking I often find that there's challenges even in my own work as somebody who's just beginning and entering into film in small ways, short docs, community filmmaking, uh, partnering with uh, local nonprofits and stuff to really bring about narratives and stories. Do you often find it very challenging to, um, first of all, find folks to work with an indigenous community? And then like, second to that, where do you see opportunities to build capacity? Because I think that people who are really involved in the idea of community filmmaking are really invested in building that capacity in our communities. That's yeah, why. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, um, when, <laughs> yeah. yeah, not at all. Uh, when I started um, out and, you know, I was really interested in telling stories about back home and I think I would get my grants because I lived in Ontario and then I would go back home and shoot and I would often work in my hometown or out on the land. Um, but because like the film infrastructure in the province of Saskatchewan, there is no tax credit there that when it came to actually making my feature, my dream had been to go home and make a feature back home 
in my community and like pull everything together. But because of the scale and the scope of the film as like a genre movie and in the near future, we ended up shooting here in Ontario, um, which I was also really happy to do. Like Ontario has been home for years, but I think there's something really special about what it is to like engage in work especially on your homelands, like it just has a different resonance and to work with elders from back home. But what really meant a lot to me on Night Raiders was um, the opportunity to work with Elder Pauline Shirt because she is Cree from the prairies, but she's also been living in Toronto for many, many years. So the fact that she, it was almost like she brought that piece of home, you know, um, as the elder who appears in the film, but also the elder that was supporting us through the making of the film. Um, so that was really meaningful. And I think that even if you're transplanted off your homelands, there are still things you can do um, to create a space that says like, we are here in an indigenous space, which is, you know, like working with the communities that we're shooting in. And a lot of that work was actually done by our associate producer, Eva Thomas, who worked with local you know, communities around where we were shooting and also paid attention to engaging in cultural protocols in the right way. And then also the cultural protocols that were a part of you know, set, like the practices that we need in order to do things in a good way. And I think that even by, the act of making that available to actors and to people who need it, it's sort of like a declaration that this is an indigenous space, mm -hmm. even if you're transplanted. And especially even in the context of, you know, we're trying to do this within a big machine of set culture that wants to push forward and move in certain ways and operate in a hierarchical way. And I don't think one film can undo those things that I think we've still got a lot of work to do, but I think the ways that we can press into that is really important. Um, but I think those filmmakers who are working and living and shooting in their own communities have something really special. And I'm thinking particularly of Darlene Napontz who lives in Northern Ontario, Ontario near Sudbury on a Tikamikshing and Nishnabe. And she, um, you know, has her studio there, she works there and she engages the community there. And she now has a crew that work on her film sets every single time. And I just think that would be incredible. And I also think that there's a lot of work being done to um, help build capacity of like indigenous people to be engaged on all levels of crew. And like, I was an, and like I came into the, I didn't go to film school. I did not study. It's like I got into film because there was a tax credit in Saskatchewan and I got a job in a very entry level position. And that was the point. Like that's like almost the beginning of my origin story of understanding that a career in film was even possible. And then it took even years for after that moment to even realize that like directing was possible. Um, but those opportunities for indigenous people to be on sets are really potentially game changing and really important. And also indigenous set presence is really important. Like we ran a mentorship program that was funded by the indigenous screen office. And, you during know, I, yeah, during Night Raiders. Wow, that's and so cool. yeah, and I think people think about mentorship as like this, oh, we're we bestow you with this knowledge, you know, young men mentor and you know, or mentee, and you know, take it and learn. But for me, the presence of the indigenous mentees on our set meant that like there that it actually gave something back to me even as the director it's like nobody wants to be in these spaces and be the only one because you have to hold a certain space when you're the only one and as soon as there are others to share that in it's like something grows and becomes stronger and it's hard to put your finger on but I could feel it in in the energy of what we were trying to do when I was making Night Raiders and I could feel these strong indigenous women around me like Eva Thomas and also our producers from New Zealand um, and there were some folks from New Zealand that came up and it was just like there was something protective about that um, that it felt like that we were making the film in that kind of context. 
yeah, and there was a scene, you know, where everyone's kind of sat around the fire. And I wonder how that actually felt like when the when there was a drummer uh, singing and the elder was doing their prayer. And I saw the kinships that looked beyond. They looked real because they probably were. You know what I mean? Like once you spend so much time with people on set, I think that your relationships develop. And that really shone through uh in the film for me. Like I could tell that people were totally engaged. Um, I'm not exactly sure who the drummer was who was singing, but when he was singing, I was, I was sucked right into the film and I could tell that everybody who was engaged in that scene was truly there and present. And I guess it was that real, like that, that had to be right. Yeah. Like I, I that was a beautiful, <laughs> yeah, that was a beautiful scene to shoot. I feel like I remember shooting it and kind of not wanting it to end, but I would say the entire um, shoot week that we did in the bush, um, and it was a cedar forest. So it was so oh. beautiful, like to be on Anishinaabe land, telling a Cree story, but like, because cedar is obviously a medicine, um, to be in that forest, it had that protective kind of energy. And, you know, prior to that, we've been shooting these like totally dystopian scenes and like industrial yeah. Hamilton and like very urban and like really desolate. And so to come into that forest and to be there together, it really did feel like it had a spirit. And um, I remember loving every minute of shooting there um, and really feeling the energy of everyone and like that, the love of everyone. Yeah, and especially with such difficult subject matter, you know, addressing residential schools in this future tense, um, like, you know, I, I think about best practices and, and the way that you're bringing in indigenous kind of um, ways of being into your set. And some of the examples that you gave just really resonated with me as, as they translate into kind of all spaces that we create for our communities to kind of gather. So I was going to get more into that, but it's, we've covered a lot of that right <laughs> through this conversation. Um, so I'm going to hop right into what of all our film folks tuning in want to know. What is, what is it about genre filmmaking that excites you and how does it support your storytelling? Yeah, I um, I sort of fell into genre by accident when I made a short film that was a genre film. And prior to that, I just made straight up dramas. But I just found that there was a freedom in genre um, because you were no longer constricted by like straight up reality. And that for me, because I had something to say, it's like it felt like I could almost hit my message harder um, when you um, have fictional things to pull on. And I think I was trying to counter this sort of fatigue around, you know, what happened at residential schools where people are like, oh, do we have to talk about this again? Or like, I think it is truly like something as horrific as what happened is truly challenging for people even to let in. And so I think there's like a lot of denial and a lot of fatigue that goes on. And so I felt like the genre offered like a fresh way into it to say, you know, we want to look at the impact of what happens when children are taken away from their parents. What does that do to families? What does that do to communities? But in a genre space, it's like it offers a fresh way in. And it also offers like, almost like the, the, the fictionalization of everything is a layer for protection as well for everybody making the film. And so that felt like it was an element too. I found it really interesting, the intersection between the fictional and like some indigenous ideologies. Like there was at one point where um, the youth at the beginning talked about how the mosquito was breathing and gave it like this animate quality. I wonder how intentional that was, I guess, in your work. I'd love to discuss that a little bit more. Like when I heard it, I heard it from a lens whereby um, when, when it said that the, the mosquito had artificial intelligence and I thought about how that related to indigeneity in the future, I'd love for us to discuss that a little more. I thought that was super cool. Yeah, I um, one of the things I do when I'm developing any film is I sit down at the table with my dad and talk to him about Cree concepts because um, that's his first language. And so because I don't 
speak Cree fluently. It's like I will always think of things with an English brain, whereas he comes at it from a Cree worldview and perspective. And so my dad's involvement in the development of all of my films is really important. And it's not just that he's like playing the role of a translator or like I do the thing and then he translates it for me. It's like I really try to talk about things and listen to what he says about certain concepts. And one of the things that I was interested in is in a futuristic con um, context is, you know, there's obviously this trope in tons of genre movies about AI. And as soon as AI becomes sentient, it's going to kill us all. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a lot of indigenous um, folks that have critiqued that and said like, that has to be the view of a colonizer. Like, of course, a colonizer is afraid that as soon as this like has any um, agency, it's going to colonize you. Like, of course, you would have that fear if you're if you're a colonizer. And so I thought that was really interesting. But one of the things that helped kind of subvert that trope was um, in the structure of the Cree language, there is a breakdown of things that are considered animate and inanimate. So you refer to things differently. And in the language, rocks are animate. And I think it's even referenced in the movie in the camp. There's an elder who has actually played by my dad speaking Cree to the kids. Oh, cool. And he's saying, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Um, and he's saying, you know, we view the rocks as animate. And what's that? what that's getting at is the worldview that does not necessarily regard the machines in the same way as a Euro Western lens would. And so Wasis has grown up with animals and she is very intuitive and she knows how to call animals like anyone who lives on the land, like my family that grew up in Cumberland House, Saskatchewan, like they all know how to call animals and to like, you know, all this amazing skill set that gets so undervalued um, by the broader culture. And I just imagined that. Wasis is open and she just doesn't have these ideas. And so, you know, she does not regard the machines in the way that other people would. And it's part of what makes her so unique, but that that uniqueness is cultural. You know, it's a part of who she is because of the culture that she comes from. The children became a, just a huge part of this process. So whether they were, you know, the, the girls in the school or, um, kids on set, like, and how youth really kind of framed up um, this, this whole filmmaking process. So you want to talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of throughout the film um, and the narrative was certainly very inspired by Indigenous youth in our communities. And I remember once hearing a panel and, this, uh, and a youth was speaking and he said, you know, I'm so tired of having to be resilient. Like I want to imagine a future where I don't have to be resilient. And that just really resonated with me in terms of like the youth are so incredible. And I was especially inspired by Idle No More. That's really like the catalyst for Night Raiders. And it happened just in the season before I started writing. And there was something about the youth and the way that they were standing up and unafraid to be seen and heard. And it was so beautiful that I knew I had to reflect that in some way. Um, and, and just like their outlook and also the way that they like step into themselves. And I think all of the characters in the movie are on a similar path, which is their arc is that they are asked to step into their own power and each of us each of them must find their own ways of doing that. Um, but then also like, you know, I had my kids on set and I think that an indigenous spaces are really inclusive of family and of children. And, um, you know, I felt like those values, like I, I love reflecting that somehow. Like, I think it's also a very, you know, Euro Western thing to really separate kids from the workplace. And it's like, I had my kids out, I had, my niece out who's a toddler and my daughter who was 10 like called action on like this huge action sequence. So like the presence of the kids and what they mean and especially in the context of the fact that it's the kids that were taken away from our families. Yeah. And it's like, we owe it to them um, to, to, you know, they're giving us so much. And so I just felt like I almost like responded in kind in a way to like, tell a story about how much we love them and how incredible they are. 
Yeah, and I think that normalizing children in the workplace and in creative spaces is really like building their capacity to move forward with our storytelling. Uh, and the fact that I got to watch that film with my daughter was really kind of empowering, you know, because I, we got to view the mother-daughter relationship and really sit and discuss it. So there was an interview where you spoke about films such as Night Raiders and imagining an Indigenous future as an act of activism. Um, you said something along the lines of we weren't even supposed to have a future. I wonder if you can elaborate on that for our audiences. Yeah, you know, um, Canada was founded upon, you know, the uh, is a was a violent takeover of this land. And, you know, what is now coming to light, which has been known in our communities for so long is the horror and the violence of what that looked like. And it is literally, you know, on the death of our children in Indigenous communities. And so, um, you know, it's like what the Canadian state's mandate was, was to, you know, as one of the Indian agents or like the architects of the residential school, I can't remember exactly who said it, but, you know, it was like their job was to get rid of the Indian problem. And that was the quote. And so it was like, you know, this was a project to erase us on our own land. And so when we engage in imagining futures, which first off is spaces that you never see Indigenous people in, you know, we're never in space or in the future or in whatever, but it's a subversive act to imagine us in the future because it is like saying, we have always been here, we are still here, but we will always be here. And that is declarative and um, it goes against everything that, um, you know, that Canada as a country tried to do. And I think, you know, um, yeah, so that's to me always what, what it's meant is that it's really powerful to imagine a future. And there's like, you know, when you, when you look at that, there's, there's whole uh, teams and, 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 and major uh, Indigenous artists um, kind of taking up that space and, and really diving into um, incredible bodies of work. And so I guess teamwork in the films is really important. And what was it like to work with such an incredible team like Tara Woodbury and, and Taika uh, Watiti? And um, I guess there must be a lot of strength in those kinds of collaborations. Yeah, there is a lot. Um, it, there, a film like this takes like so much to get off the ground. And I, I really am not, a fan of the classic auteur theory where it's like there's a director and they have a vision and they're going to bestow their vision upon every person to like, like where basically your collaborators are just there to do your bidding and realize your vision. I really think of film as a truly collaborative um, art form and it really is about, you know, building something together and also accepting that not only accepting, but hoping that my collaborators are coming with their own visions and then that matching with my vision and then creating something new, like what a beautiful process. And I think it also in terms of working with the actors and this cast, it's like they are, you know, they were willing to be so vulnerable and so brave and to bring parts of their own lived experience. I mean, um, it's, you know, when I was just reading this interview with Helen Haig Brown, who is the director of um, Edge of the Knife, which was a Haida language film that was shot um, a few years ago. And she said that when she met with the Isuma team, that they talked about a process that is unobstructive and that the director's role is to be unobstructive. And I just thought, what a beautiful philosophy and how different um, that is to what we have always imagined the director's role to be. And so I've thought about that and I've always been really excited by that idea. You know, it's about creating a space where, you know, we can then discover things together. And just valuing the contribution, I guess, of people who are bringing them their, their whole selves to the table, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's really incredible to see um, stories of such significance told by people who've been 
potentially and most likely um, impacted by them. So mm -hmm. impacted. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. At the Night Raiders premiere at TIFF, um, there was ceremony before the opening of the film and during the introductions. What an opportunity to indigenize spaces. So not just through the work, but also through then the showing and the telling and, and making sure that that whole space represents uh, an indigenous view. Yeah, it was so, that night was so beautiful because we were programmed as a gala at film or at TIFF, which was like this huge, you know, red carpet event. And it was incredible to see the red carpet rolled out for everybody and like to see the cast all honored in that way and for the film to be elevated and honored in that way. But like, as soon as we came in there, you know, Elder Pauline Shirt opened us up in the most beautiful way. And I just felt like, again, it's that, that where you go into the space and right away there's that signal that this is the space that we're in and this is the story that we're telling. And then afterwards in the Q and A, my dad came on stage and gave me a blanket. And um, yeah, it was, it was so moving. I was just really, yeah, it was a really beautiful experience and really collective. And it was made all the more special um, by the fact that like, we've all been in COVID times and there was like this little window last summer where everything felt like it was open enough. And so the theater was at 50% capacity and it like, it felt so amazing. And it was a lot of people's first time in a room with other people. Um, and so it was really incredible like to, to, to kind of like have that collective experience because I feel like that's all that I've been craving. Like when you put a film out into the world, it's like you really do want to commune with people about it. Yeah, there's something anticlimactic about these virtual spaces, right? When we're so yeah. you as a people, you know, um, across indigenous cultures, I guess gathering is just so important and celebration is just so important. And doing that in person is just so important and doing it yes. in a day, right? So uh, I'm glad that you got to be in the physical space with uh, your peeps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so what, great. Are you, what, what are you working on next? Um, I am starting to develop projects. Um, one is a project that is set back home in La Ronge, Saskatchewan, my hometown. And um, there's a project that I'm developing with Tasha Hubbard and Shane Belcourt about Jim Brady, a Métis activist who was active from like the 30s to the 60s and sort of was like... Um, very, you know, he was sort of like the the second wave of Métis activism that not a lot of people know about, like post sort of Riel. Um, and then I, I also just shot a Netflix thriller. And so I'm in post on that. And that was a really fun experience. So that'll roll out onto the platform at some point this year. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's great. It's a good time to sort of just like I'm the sort of back in development and being creative. And it feels really great. It's such a loaded question you when you ask another artist like what they're working on because I'm sure it's like <laughs> 10 million things it's just like what are you working on for me sometimes I'm like oh god <laughs> yeah such a big question is there anything that you'd like for us to kind of discuss yeah there's one thing I would love to mention and um in the making of the film one of the things that was really special about especially the part that was shot in in the community section of the film was like how much it was in the language. And um, Gail Maurice, who I've admired for so long and I've worked with her before um, is an incredible actor. And so to find like so much talent in one person and those, and for her to perform in the language, it really was so awesome when she got nominated for a Canadian Screen Award for that performance, especially because it was in the language. But there's such a power to that and to working into the language. And those things were some of the most, like my favorite parts of shooting was when we were shooting in the language because um, yeah, like language is part of what was try what they tried to erase. And there is so much richness and beauty and poetry in the language. And I'm a Cree language learner and I've gone to Cree immersion camps um, 
every year, actually in the years leading up to making Night Raiders. And I feel like those Cree immersion camps prepared me for this project in a way that like, I couldn't even really put my finger on, but it was just like some kind of preparation. And I just know that, um, you know, learning the language for me personally is something that is so like restorative, like, you know, as indigenous people, we're just so wrapped up in the fight all the time and the advocacy and like the demands for justice. It feels like, and those kinds of things are important, but they always take energy and they're always taking from us. So it's like, you know, to have like parts of the things that I've been interested in lately have been really around like, what do we do, um, you know, to make spaces restorative or like, what do we do to have things that are just ours or like bring us joy or like revitalize or like nation build and to me, language learning and then the process and also the presence of the language in um, Night Raiders and other films that I've made is just like, it, it's just so, so important to me. And it's such a beautiful opportunity to highlight Indigenous languages, you know, it's such a great audience. I think it's critical at this point that it be considered in in uh, in filmmaking and, you know, to unapologetically have, have language be highlighted and celebrated in the works. I think it really set the tone of the piece and like I was totally grounded um, once the, the language began, you mm -hmm. know, I just felt even though it's not my language, but yeah. I'm on a language journey too. And I think that it's it's a space that a lot of Indigenous folks can relate to. And just to hear it um, on screen and and not understand it necessarily, but know that that, that intention has been set through language was uh, pretty profound. So uh, thank you for mentioning that. I think that that's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. So I just want to thank you uh, for sitting in conversation with me. And uh, I really, I'm really honored that we got to share uh, some ideas together in some space. And I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in to Seen and Heard with the St. John's International Women's Film Festival. And in my language, we say this, which means I'll see you again, because we never say goodbye. That just said thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Alan, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much.